Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A-Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I will be going on with respiration to explain anaerobic respiration and respiratory substrate. So I'm sure that the last video was probably a bit daunting for some of you, but if it is, please just ask questions as many as you can. Don't be ashamed and also don't be afraid. Something I say a lot in my classroom is that there are no stupid questions and there are no questions that don't make sense. Just make sure you put them out there so that we can um, address any uh, misconceptions that you have and be able to help you excel well in the exams. I feel the need to state the purpose for this channel again. I am posting the um, AS and A-level biology content in chronological order to help students prepare for their exams. So these are mostly going to be revision videos um, or you can consider them as such if you've been going to classes or if you're just learning the content for the first time they might also be good content to expose yourself to before you go to class so that you have key questions to ask your teacher. I also use these videos in my classroom as well so that my students are more engaged in the classes and they're able to have discussions with me as we go through the topic. So please share the video with uh, the channel with your friends, ask them to subscribe and thank you to everyone who has subscribed. I really did not expect the numbers to grow so steadily um, so I'm very grateful to everyone. Thank you so much and I hope that you find Find more of these videos helpful as I go along. So today I am going to be starting or I'm going to be concluding respiration sort of uh, by speaking about anaerobic respiration and respiratory substrates. I do feel the need to tell you though that this is not the last um, video for this chapter. We have a video on adaptations for respiration uh, which I will record soon and also put on the channel. So what is anaerobic respiration? If you recall from the last video, which is chapter 12.2, um, respiration, aerobic respiration in detail, there I was discussing the different steps that happen in respiration whenever you have oxygen present. So aerobic respiration is the presence of, is respiration in the presence of oxygen, while anaerobic respiration is respiration without oxygen. When you don't have oxygen, remember when we learned about aerobic respiration, we had glycolysis, which is the splitting of glucose to form pyruvate. And then we had the link reaction where pyruvate is decarboxylated and dehydrogenated to form acetal. And that is combined with coenzyme A to then form acetal-CoA. That moves into the Krebs cycle um, where we then have a series of reactions by having acetal combined with um, oxaloacetate to form citrate and so on and so forth. And then we go to oxidative phosphorylation where the electrons from NADH and FADH are transported through electron carriers or what we call the electron transport chain so as to produce ATP. But remember that at the end of the electron transport chain, oxygen was the final electron acceptor. When oxygen is not present, it means that the cell cannot undergo oxidative phosphorylation. So that means that there would be no Krebs cycle because there's no need to go through all that trouble if the NADH and FADH will not be used as they should be. In that case, what happens is that the NADH that we make from glycolysis releases its oxygen through different pathways, or rather releases its hydrogen through different pathways that do not involve oxygen. And the two pathways that we are going to learn about are the alcoholic fermentation pathway and the lactic fermentation pathway. Both of these pathways happen in the cytoplasm, so they don't involve the mitochondria. Let's start off with alcoholic fermentation. When I discuss this with students, I often ask them, if you've ever made bread, what do you add to bread to make it rise, um, to make the dough rise? And they often say yeast. And I say, well, that's good. Yeast is a eukaryotic organism, um, and it also has um, the ability to ferment sugar in particular. It can ferment sugar to form an alcohol. So it undergoes this alcoholic fermentation pathway. 
This pathway is peculiar to microorganisms. So as human beings, we don't make ethanol in our bodies. We make a different kind of uh, product when we undergo anaerobic respiration. But as for the microorganisms, this is the pathway that they undergo. So if you have a look here, I'm just again going to annotate using my red pen. Um, we have glucose over here, and glucose will undergo glycolysis. So irrespective of whether or not oxygen is present, glycolysis will always happen. So remember for glycolysis that we use two ATP molecules, and we make um, four ATP molecules. But because we've used two, that means we have a net total of two, and we also make two NADH, right? Um, and what then happens here is that this NADH um, is added, the, ox the hydrogen from it rather, is added to pyruvate in order to make ethanol. This is written as ethyl alcohol, but it's ethanol. And that is simply the process of alcoholic fermentation. I'm just going to go through it again so that you don't, um, just in case that went over your head a little bit. Um, so you convert glucose to ethanol in alcoholic fermentation. What this simply means is that when oxygen is absent, Glucose will still undergo glycolysis as it normally would. Pyruvate, and then it would form pyruvate, right? Pyruvate would then be decarboxylated, as you can see here, to form CO2. Um, it will be decarboxylated, and it would form what we call ethanol. So ethanol is not shown here. Ethanol is then reduced. That means the hydrogen from NADH is then added to ethanol in order to form ethanol. And the enzyme that catalyzes that is called alcohol dehydrogenase. So I've just put the notes here on the slide so that you're also able to just take note of that. Um, so always remember here you have glycolysis, you form pyruvate. Pyruvate goes first of all to ethanol. I'm um, just going to write that here, ethanol. This was one of the best um, infographics I could find. Um, so even though it was missing a little bit of detail, I felt like I could just add that. So pyruvate goes to ethanol. Ethanol is then reduced by the addition of hydrogen from NADH, which is removed. Um, hydrogen is removed from NADH. Um, so that hydrogen is added to ethanol in order to form ethanol. This is ethanol. Um, it's written as ethyl alcohol, uh, which would typically be correct in chemistry. But for biology, we just call it ethanol. And so, yeah, that is what happens in alcoholic fermentation. The result, the total ATP that you make is just two, which tells you that with fermentation, the energy yield is not that great. So let's now discuss lactic fermentation. Like I said in the previous um, slide, on the previous slide, alcoholic fermentation is for microorganisms. So like yeast, for example, that you use in making bread um, is a microorganism that is able to ferment sugars into alcohol. In this case, with lactic fermentation, it's usually a result of our muscles being oxygen deprived. So if you go for a long run, for example, at some point, um, especially when you're close to the end of your run, depending on how fit you are, you find yourself breathing really hard. Um, and that's because you don't have enough oxygen going through your muscles anymore, and your body is likely going through lactic fermentation. What happens in lactic fermentation is that glucose will undergo glycolysis as usual. Remember that I said that irrespective of whether or not oxygen is present, glycolysis will always happen. So glucose undergoes glycolysis and it forms pyruvate as expected. But what happens here is that it also makes the NADH from glycolysis and makes the ATP and all of those things. The NADH will then give, I'm just going to use my pen over here, the NADH will then donate its hydrogen to pyruvate. So pyruvate acts as the final hydrogen acceptor. It donates its hydrogen to pyruvate and in so doing converts pyruvate to lactate which is what you can see here and this is what we refer to as lactic fermentation. Lactic fermentation, however, does not continue indefinitely. Um, it is a reversible pathway in humans. It's simply a way to make sure that we can keep carrying out our activities um, until we are able to recover. Um, it's reversible while the ethanol pathway in microorganisms is not reversible. What happens to the lactate that's formed in the body is that it is carried to the liver and converted back to pyruvate. So once you're done running and you're now relaxing and breathing numbly, 
the lactate will be carried to the liver, converted to pyruvate, and pyruvate will then go through the aerobic respiration pathway, which will then be the link, link reaction, the Krebs cycle, and oxidative phosphorylation. Um, the liver will oxidize 20% of lactate to CO2 and water, um, which is why you produce metabolic water when you exercise for a very long time. Um, when oxygen is available, again, it does that. Um, some of the lactate is converted to glycogen by the liver. Whenever you have strenuous exercise, your body um, will absorb oxygen at a higher rate um, than, is, that is norm, than is normal, rather. And so your heart and your lungs have to cope with that because it's like an increased supply, but they don't have an increased capacity. So lactic fermentation just provides a way for them to be able to catch up um, when you're trying to recover. So in this way, lactic fermentation creates an oxygen deficit because yes, your body is absorbing oxygen, but the oxygen is not being used because the lungs and the heart are unable to transport that oxygen quickly enough. So if you study chapter eight, I'm sure this would make sense, but if you haven't, then it might be a bit difficult. So please make sure you have a look at chapter eight and chapter nine, because then that would be very helpful. But basically the point of this is that when you run or when you do any strenuous exercise, you create an oxygen deficit within your body. And so when you're done with your exercise, I don't know if you've noticed, but for me, when I go to the gym and I'm done, I spend about three minutes just ah, catching my breath uh, right outside the gym before I get into my car. That is what we call an oxygen depth, right? So you have an oxygen debt that you need to pay back through heavy breathing. And what that does is that it gives you more oxygen so that Lactate can be converted to uh, glycogen in the liver um, so that you can reoxygenate your hemoglobin in the blood and so that you can increase your metabolic rate uh, because some of the organs are operating at higher than normal levels. So these are the things that you use your post-exercise breathing for. With that said, that is the end of anaerobic respiration, basically. That's all that you need to know. The last part that I think is just a little bit technical still is respiratory substrates and their energy values. Um, and here I'm just going to show you how to calculate the respiratory quotient, um, because that's usually a question that pops up every now and then. You never know when it will come. Okay, so again, what do cells use for energy? And I think at the beginning of respiration, we sort of spoke about this, that some cells in the body will use glucose as an essential substrate. Um, and these include the neurons in the brain, for example. I don't know if you've heard this, but your brain always prefers glucose, which is why many people protest against the diets like the keto diet or the paleo diet, where people are not allowed to eat um, glucose, um, carbohydrates generally. Your red blood cells will also prefer to use glucose as an essential substrate and so will your lymphocytes. Other cells are able to use lipids or amino acids, which is what your um, ketogenesis um, or ketogenic diets are based on. Um, when lipids are used, um, two carbon atoms are removed at a time as acetal um, and fed into the Krebs cycle. So lipids are also able to be broken down and put through the Krebs cycle. When you use amino acids, the carbon and the hydrogen are converted into acetal or pyruvate and then they also go through the Krebs cycle. But the question obviously is that how much energy do we get from our different uh, respiratory substrates? The key thing to always bear in mind is that the greater the number of hydrogens and the structure of substrate molecules, um, the greater the energy. And also I just want to say here that when I make references to diet, it's not because I'm trying to um, sort of instill the culture of diet and into anyone's mind. It's just the example that comes easily to mind that you might be able to relate to very easily uh, because you can just see like you know what for example like what are the um, foundational principles of some of the things that we do and dieting when it comes to things like energy and food um, and breakdown of food into energy dieting is just the easiest example so I'm just putting that out there so that nobody feels um, attacked or conscious in any way that um, I'm trying to put dieting as a thing into your mind while teaching biology I am just teaching biology Okay, so the respiratory quotient. Now, this is usually a number that you get that would be able to tell you 
um, what is like what is basically happening during respiration, um, what kind of substrate you're using. It is defined by an equation, which is what I have put here on the slide. I'm just going to get my pen here. Um, so it's called the RQ, and it's usually the volume of CO2 given out in unit time divided by the volume of oxygen taken in in unit time. And um, this over here is just a calorimeter. So you use a calorimeter to determine how many calories or basically energy. So calories are energy, right? Um, how many calories um, of a respiratory substance are present um, in that, in that um, compound? So this is how we calculate RQ. And I'm just going to show you um, some examples on the next slide. So over here, um, this is typically what you would get when you're calculating the respiratory quotient. They tell you, um, for example, you have um, CO2 over here, you have oxygen over here. Um, this is under aerobic conditions. And what you typically have to do is you have to calculate the moles of CO2 to get your respiratory quotient um, divided by the moles of oxygen, just over here. And what this would give you, um, here you have 18 moles of CO2, here you have 25.5 miles of, uh, moles, not miles, 25.5 miles, moles of oxygen. I don't know why I keep saying that. I don't know why I'm thinking of miles. Uh, but one thing I just want to say here, whenever you're calculating the respiratory quotient, sometimes they don't give you the entire formula. They simply give you the respiratory compound itself. So they can just give you this. Um, I think this is oleic acid. And they say, well, find the respiratory quotient. The first thing you'd have to do is to check that your equation is balanced. So if it's under aerobic conditions, always remember that you combine it with oxygen and you form CO2 and water. So always make sure that everything is balanced in your equation so that nothing um, is amiss with your calculations. So in this case over here, you're just going to do 18 divided by 25.5. Don't worry, this is a balanced equation I checked. Um, and the value you get here, um, for some reason, I can't um, access a calculator right now. Um, let me just see if I can find one quickly. Okay, got one. So 18 divided by 25.5 is going to give you um, 0 0.7. Um, and this is the respiratory quotient. And I'll just show you um, how you can tell that this is um, a lipid that you're dealing with or carbohydrate or anything like that. Now let's look at the anaerobic uh, side of things. So if you're calculating respiratory quotient for an anaerobic reaction, there is usually no oxygen, as you can see here. This is just glucose over here, and then you have ethanol, and then you have CO2. But you still use the same formula, which is interesting. Um, and most of the time, by the way, they don't ask you to calculate in anaerobic because the answers typically just come out the same. So again, using the moles of CO2, which is 2, divided by the moles of oxygen, which is 0. And the answer here is just infinity. Um, that's what you get for anaerobic. So again, you don't really get questions on these. But the question you might be asking then is when I calculate um, for a certain substrate in, in aerobic conditions, how do I know that I'm dealing with a lipid or um, glucose or carbohydrate or anything like that? Here you go. These are the respiratory quotients of the three groups, the three key groups that we use um, in respiration. So you have your carbohydrates, you have your lipids, and you have your proteins. As you can see there, the carbohydrates have a respiratory quotient of one, which means that the amount of CO2 that you give off whenever you um, respire a carbohydrate is equal to the amount of oxygen that you take in. Um, and lipids, what this is basically saying is that the amount of CO2 that you give off is less than the amount of oxygen that you take in. So you have um, a factor of 0 0.7 and with proteins, it's very close to carbohydrates. It is 0 0.9. I'm going to stop this video here. I have one more video on how rice is adapted um, for respiration and I'll record that very soon. Um, but I just thought to put out respiration out there. I know some of you are preparing for the May-June exams. I don't know if I'll be able to get all the content out there on time, but I really hope that whatever I get out is helpful to you. Thank you again to those of you who have subscribed, those of you who have shared the channel with your friends. I'm really, really grateful. Again, I was not expecting the increase that I saw uh, when I checked the channel a couple of days ago. Um, so I'm really excited that this is really helpful to you. And thank you to those who have requested videos. So I will post these um, 
coming very soon. And I will also um, start with chapter 13, which is photosynthesis. I also promised that I was going to do past questions with you, and I'm going to get to that. I will do some of the difficult past questions that I have come across that would be helpful to you. Thank you, guys. Have a good time.